<laughs> this same thing. Oh. Same thing. Okay. Um, freeing Sisyphus declaratively addressing web security issues. Lucas heads up the security team in Mozilla, hurts bugs, and tries hard to make the internet a happier and safer place. Previously, Lucas was a security architect at Adobe, focused on Flash Player and Air. He also worked at Adstake and developed security managed services software at Breakwater Security. So, thank you. So, thank you for all for coming. I was say so I got a, I was very inspired by the sort of very positive and uplifting uh, keynotes we had this morning. They really made me very optimistic. So, in that vein, I think this is kind of continuing in that happy sort of groove. Um, so, you go to security conferences, a lot of fear, a lot of frustration. Um, this is kind of understandable. You hear sort of perception of we are doomed. Um, I can't really argue that one, so we're just going to move on. Um, endless parade of cross-site scripting, CSRF overflows. Nothing's been done about it. Um, and that perception is pretty understandable. I mean, if you've been for, to these conferences for years and years and you're seeing your 27th cross-site scripting talk, it gets a little frustrating. Um, users are clueless. The sort of frustration of users are really not getting it. Users are not getting used better about security and trying to train users to make the right decisions is, is seeming to be a, a sort of never-ending battle. And also the sort of dumbing down of security relates to the previous topic that, that we're basically giving up on users, right? We're saying, look, they're just not qualified to make decisions. So we're going to take decisions away, which is frustrating people that are very um, skilled in security. They want to have the information. They'll make the decisions based on that information, right? So what does fear lead to? I know this is not Star Wars. Unfortunately, in this case, fear leads to loathing. Um, loathing of standards and security, the perception that the standards plus security equals broken, um, that standards aren't really addressing security effectively, and people are pushing weird stuff out there, and then we have to all go clean, clean up the mess. Um, that software vendors are not cooperating, not discussing these, these problems, and also going off and developing their own one-off solutions that may or may not actually work, but are almost certainly not interoperable with everybody, everybody else's security model, right? Um, users never learn. That's possible, right? I'm not actually ruling that. That just simply may be the case. Um, functionality and complexity increasing. This is actually a big problem, right? Like, if you look at the security model, of browsers becoming more complex. And this is because browsers sort of got stagnant, right? There's this weird thing when the dot-com happened and everybody got more complicated and there's all this competition and people built great stuff, except in the browser, where nothing happened for like five years. Um, and when you sort of Firefox sort of re-enter the market, it fired off a competition. You have you know Safari, you have Chrome, you still have Opera out there. You have a lot of people, and it's sort of like the dot-com again, in the sense that like, there's all this rapid innovation, and the model is changing, becoming more complex year after year. And on top of it, the current model is changing underneath you, where you know, if you test some exploit against a version, you know, an update comes out, and you've got to retest everything again, because whatever your presentation contains it may no longer be accurate vis-a-vis -vis the latest update of a given you know, security package, right? Um, and this rate of change is accelerating, right? We're seeing more and more innovation. If you're looking at, you know, if you've been following the W3C spec process, a ton of stuff, you know, HTML5, there's cross-domain loading mechanisms. There's talk of, you know, there's like 3D rendering. You could deliver potentially a shader to a browser and have it execute and have like a rich 3D environment inside a browser. Really interesting stuff and scary. So standards and security, there's a couple problems here. Um, one is the security community isn't really participating, right? The security community often behaves as, as a consumer of these standards rather than an active participant in these standards. And that's neither productive nor really necessary, right? These things are fairly open. And I would encourage everybody to go take a look at you know, W3C mailing lists and the specs are out there and participate and comment, and, and comment in them, right? Because that's how you get the change that you want before it just gets finalized and implemented and then everybody has to live with it. Politicized. Vendor competition can limit the, the potential solutions, right? And this is not really as, as maybe as, as nefarious as it seems. This is simply, unfortunately, the fact that every company has agenda, everything they want to do. In some cases, actually happens is that there are small organizations that participate in the standardization process with the goal of getting their pet feature in there, right? And you have these discussions getting derailed by the fact that somebody just really desperately wants something in the specs. So that way, everybody implements it, and they can go 
do something. Um, pattern law is becoming a serious problem here too. There's, there's a lot of fear of what they call submarine patents where um, an organization will actually try to standardize something knowing they have a patent they haven't really talked about, haven't made public yet. We don't hope it gets standardized, everybody implements and suddenly, hey, they whip out the patent and now you're in trouble, right? So there's a lot of um, angst and, and, and the process is not as functional as it really ought to be. But I think it is improving slowly. And some things really aren't well suited to standards. Like trying to standardize UI, we've had these discussions a couple times with different, different standards bodies and, and the idea of having a way of dictating how UI should work is a wonderful concept in theory, but the reality is nobody, trust me, nobody wants to use a UI designed by a committee. If you have a UI that's designed by a bunch of different working groups that dictate you have to have this icon here and this icon there and this wording has to be yellow and a font size X or Y, it, it's going to suck. You're not going to use the product. So there are limitations what you can even try to standardize effectively um, in terms of security and UI. Uh, next. Yes. Complexity is increasing. Um, I've noticed this trend a couple of times talking to researchers that, you know, when I worked at Adobe and now that they go do a presentation about some topic and they have things in the presentation simply aren't really accurate, right? Um, it's easy to sort of, you know, pick on the researcher and go, oh, you should have done a better job. But the other these things are incredibly complicated, right? Like when I worked at Adobe, I worked on a flash player security model. And it was a full time job trying to keep that thing in my head at all times, right? Like it was really brutal. Um, so if you're in the business and you're not, it's not your job full time to babysit the security model of Flash Player or Reader or something else. It's really hard to keep this in your head, right? Um, and that's kind of leading, and this is sort of related to the first keynote maybe today actually, is this sort of leading to a gradual shift in leadership in terms of mitigation from researchers to software vendors, right? Because the people that really understand their, their product well enough and the security model well enough to really try to figure out what to do about a given issue are often not researchers anymore because it's just too damn complicated, right? And by the time you find an exploit and you, 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 know, you go do the press stuff and you find out something really cool and you talk about it and then you blog about it, you don't have time. Um, this may not be a bad thing, right? Like if, if this really frees up the security community to focus on offensive stuff and finding new exploits and attack vectors and but cooperate with the vendor trying to solve these problems, it might be actually a really good relationship. So software vendor cooperation and occasional lack thereof. So this is sort of a pet peeve of mine. I think that when you get a model where every vendor independently tries to solve something like cross-site scripting or clickjacking or CSRF, XSS, whatever, it, it, you end up with a really crappy environment. Because what happens is it, if you can't deploy as a developer the same mitigation against, say, CSRF, across all different browsers, it's really not useful. It doesn't matter in theory if there's a given mechanism in, in, you know, in Safari that works a certain way and IE8 does something different and then Firefox does something different. I mean, who cares, frankly? It's really worthless, right? So I'll give you an example of, of where, you know, like trying to figure out the security model implications of, of cross-domain loading in a browser is brutal. I'm going to sort of blow through these goals. I have to go through great detail and try to do a whole threat model on the fly, but here are the main set of models you have out there. You have the Adobe Flash Player across the main um, policy mechanism, both the original version and sort of the updated stricter version. You have Silverlight, you have Java, and you have HTML and a couple different mechanisms within HTML for doing cross the main loading and, and information sharing. First one, Flash Player. Flash Player across the main policy files, right? You've probably heard about these, the way you can drop a file on the server and says, you know, servers, the following list of servers can load data from me. It doesn't govern scripting, by the way, just data loading. So the original version, you can basically put a policy file in the root or a subdirectory would dictate access to the root or the entire server or that subdirectory and below. Um, it does send cookies or every request. And there's a new updated version that's much stricter about where you can put policy files and, and dictating. Um, you can use MIME types. You can basically, the server can specify policies only support policy files on my server if they come from the following location or only if they're served with the following MIME type. Or I absolutely will never host a valid policy file, so ignore any policy files you get from me. So Silverlight implemented support for cross-name uh, loading as well. Of course, they have to do it slightly differently. They 
created something called client access policy that XML. It must be in the root directory. It can specify which other directories are to be accessed. So you can specify you know, less than the root. You can specify just a subdirectory or more, multiple ones. Um, you can permit access only from a specific domain or list of domains or from any domain. And you can also specify which headers are allowed to be set and sent. They also implemented support for the Flash Player policy file, but unfortunately only in the root, and they force you to allow access to everybody. Okay. Oh, and it says cookies. Java. Java supports also the Flash Player policy file in the root or a subdirectory, unlike Silverlight. Um, but it does require you to permit access from all domains, and it does apparently send cookies. HTML provides cross-domain resource sharing, cores, and this is a header-based mechanism. So um, when you want to make a cross-domain request, it sends this is origin header with the origin, the domain that was making the request. It expects an access control allow origin response that specifies yes or no, basically. If it, if it says yes, it, it echoes the domain that's, that's making that request back to it that was in the origin, or it can specify star, say anybody's allowed to load stuff from me. And it does actually send cookies, except in IE8. And it uses XML HTTP request, uh, except in IE8. Cross window messaging. This is a mechanism where frames or windows can talk to each other directly. So it's sort of an analogous to cross domain data loading, but it requires actually loading content from there. So sender calls window post message. The receiver has to have an event handler registered for that message type and can then verify the, the domain of the sender and look at the message before it decides to do anything with it. Right? So it's basically bi-directional or unidirectional. And it's with cookies technically because when you you know, load a frame, you get you send all the session information for that frame. So what's the problem with this? The problem is that basically if you can't agree on what you're trying to solve, the basic architectural problem you're trying to solve, then the solutions are not going to be very useful, right? So one simple you know, fundamental sort of assumption you have to question is, is an application a domain? Or does an application need a span more than one domain, right? Like if you look at even remotely complex websites, unless you're a very simple thing, you're probably going to have more than one host in your application. And so if you start with a basic assumption, that your application or an application, something that spans more than one host, then not sending cookies is kind of frustrating because essentially you can't have a user authenticated session that spans more than one host with these cross domain loading mechanisms, right? Um, so there's sort of this concept of this problem of, of trying to solve too many problems with any standard, any sort of feature that trying to address all possible use cases, right? But you can have the same problem where it's just too simple and doesn't address most of the common use cases. And then you basically force people to use the really crappy mechanisms they've used before. So another problem that you have out there is users are not security experts, right? Um, yes. I think this is a good thing because it's not their job. Like, essentially, any security model requires users to be expert is going to fail, right? So if you're asking yourself, like, how sophisticated does my, the user have to be to understand security in my model, the answer should be not very. And so dialogues have been an example of this. Like we've, we've slowly in, in Firefox, we've been very much trying to get away from dialogues, especially modal blocking dialogues, because they just don't work, right? Like this is sort of my simulation of what happens when a user interacts with your typical security mechanism slash dialogue. Or Okay, so I think that accurately reflects what happens when a user is trying to solve a particular task in their life and runs into a security dialogue. Um, note that he still just ended up walking right out the door, right? So they get trained to essentially avoid security dialogues at all costs. If you hit one, select yes, because then you won't faceplant. 